to me, it was logical. It was logical to find out about racial issues in the church. So like, church was reorganized in 1830 by Joseph Smith, who was white. The people who were there when he did it were white, mostly his family and, and, and close friends. And then from there, those people went to talk to more of the people who were in their circle, white people. That's who they lived around. That's who they were around. That's their family and friends. So, and the church is predominantly white in the United States. If you were to tell me in a perfect world now that we made it from 1830 to now and not a single issue of, ra of racism or racial inequality had happened in the church, I would think liar. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. There's no way. There's no way. And it's not like we're the first ever to deal with this stuff. Exactly. This yeah. is universal. Absolutely. This, goes, right. this crosses every single church church yeah. uh, entrance. Well, I think this it happens everywhere. Outside of church, anything that's over, mm -hmm. any organization that's over a hundred years old yep. is going to have some type of history around racism. Racism yeah, or prejudice. Prejudice, and, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know I'm where I'm supposed to be because I went to the source to find out where I'm supposed to be. Right? Mm -hmm. I didn't ask the bishop. I didn't ask my mom. I didn't ask, you know, people in my ward who held leadership positions. I didn't read words of the prophet to see. I took everything that I was taught and the testimonies given to me by other people that I'd heard. And I went to God. I was like, oh, a prophet is perfect, you know? And then I was reminded of Abraham and Moses and yeah, yeah. all these other prophets, Peter. you know, that Amen. had yeah, made Solid. these mistakes, you know? And But we're still called to God. And I think when we come across this stuff, which we will, we need to pray. We need to ask for that witness, yeah. you know? And I think as we do that, our eyes will be open. You guys need to pray. You yeah. guys need to find out for yourself. Hey everybody, welcome to this Brothers on the Priesthood episode of our series, Brothers on the Priesthood. I am Crispin and we are the Brothers in the Foyer. We've got Andrew, we've got Will, we've got Isaiah, we've got Mo with us today. And we're going to dive right into this subject of Brothers and the Priesthood in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. As always, before we get started, we want to welcome everybody to like, subscribe, follow, share all of our videos, invite your friends, invite your family invite them to this discussion as well and as you watch this episode and watch other episodes by all means leave comments let us know what you're thinking let us know your points of view we're excited to hear from them and today we're going to dive into some of your questions that you sent us about the subject so first and foremost brothers we're going to get into this very um sensitive subject for some um or for most i would say uh, but <laughs> really quickly, just to kind of open it up, I want us to talk about our experiences with diversity in the church um, and our different, you know, locations as, as we grew up in the church. So I want to just kind of put that out there really quickly and we can briefly touch on our experiences growing up in the church, what we felt, what we've gone through. So I'll put that to Andrew first. Yeah, I'll say, um, honestly, being the only black member in our family, or not in our family, but in our ward, in our stake, we were just the only ones there. Um, everybody kind of just gravitated to us. You know, we stuck out, obviously, because we were just like a speck of pepper and a bowl of salt. You know, everybody, <laughs> everybody knew who we were, you know, but um, I, had, I had great experiences growing up. You know, I had great leaders, I had great um, young men that I, I went to church with and young women and I overall had a pretty great experience, you know. Um, and so from that aspect with dealing with race or just diversity, it wasn't really a lot. I think that's just how it goes, just being in this church. And but as you can see now, we're look at this. I mean, it's it's growing. We're, we're everywhere, you know. And so I feel like um, having this opportunity to just speak here and talk about how the church has grown, not only from where it was, but to where it is today. So I've, overall, I've had a great experience. 
that's really interesting. We're going to get more into to that perspective in a little bit. But Isaiah, for you, how was it growing up in the church and your experiences coming up? How was it from a diversity aspect growing up in the church? Uh, yeah, I mean, I was baptized in Georgia, man, um, in the suburbs of Atlanta. So for me, it was like, uh, I didn't, I was similar to Andrew. Like, I didn't have any bad experiences or I didn't feel like I was kind of set aside or treated differently, you know, being a minority in the church. Um, it was a very diverse area I was baptized in. Um, and at the time, uh, I didn't know any uh, difference in terms of the history of the church um, and what the black members at that time faced and coming up. So for me, it was just like a great experience, man. Like I was baptized. I knew I had um, faith in the Savior. I knew that this was his church. And so it wasn't until I actually moved out here to Utah to where I started to hear more so about um, the history of the church and some of the challenges that um, Black members face, you know, in the history of the church. But yeah, I personally have not had any bad experiences that I can think of um, that just kind of I, where I felt isolated, you know, um, as a member. It's also interesting as well. Um, Eye-opening for me because I did go through um, challenges when it comes to diversity in, in my word. And just like a lot of what you said, and I believe Andrew said it as well, we're the, the black speck <laughs> in the song right there. My family was the only black family in the entire state for, for a while. So we go to state conference. And this is back before you can watch it at, at so that, that tells you how old I am, I guess. But um, <laughs> you used to have to go to the state center to watch general conference and things like that, or you know, state conference in particular. But you look around and it's just us. I grew up in Texas, Dallas, Texas, so we did have um, a Spanish-speaking ward. So there was brown, but it was like the assumption if you saw anybody brown, it's like that's the Casa Linda ward. I already know who you are. <laughs> and then there's us who are obviously not in like Castle in New Orleans. <laughs> and so we were the, we, we stuck out a little bit. Um, so I didn't grow up with experiences in diversity, meaning like I could see diversity. My experience was we were the diversity. Yeah. That was it. It was just right. us. So anything that was different than the norm was us. And it was pointed out to us in a lot of different ways growing up. Some completely overt and direct, a lot that was subliminal and as we were kids, there was a lot that we didn't hear that our mom got to hear. Because not only were we black and different, my mom was a single mom with children. And that, from a stereotypical standpoint, is also different mm-hmm. uh, from the church. As the church uh, you know, preaches about families being whole, being together, father and mother in the home, we were that exception as well. So there was a lot about our family that was diverse from the norm. Mm-hmm. And it's not like it was constant. But I definitely had my experiences where it was like, oh, yeah, I am different. Oh, yeah, I am different in this space yeah, as yeah. well. So that was that's definitely my experience. But, Will, how about you? Yeah, I would say kind of similar. Uh, the experiences and the diversity uh, change with different places that we lived in. So when I lived in Georgia, I was used to seeing, you know, black leadership, black bishops, uh, black state presidents. Uh, and even black wards, you know, and so that was an eye opener to me coming from, you know, Indianapolis where, you know, we were in a small branch and it was just us as just a single, <laughs> yeah, you know, absolutely. black family. And then coming out here to Utah where, you know, it was just you and Polynesians and yeah. sometimes, you know, folks. Yeah, so yeah, so uh, it just depended on where we were <laughs> at, at the time. Um, but yeah, my experience is definitely different being out here in Utah for sure. So, yeah, I I think it's funny because I I've I kind of have like a wide range since I served my mission in Africa. Yeah. Um, so I've been like the one and only black person in the ward yeah. to the lightest person <laughs> which, <laughs> or, or stake and branch. Yeah, so I kind of have that like wide range of experiences. All have been pretty good. I mean. Similar to you, like my mom was a single mom raising two boys of a different color (laughs) in the church. So there's definitely that like uh, stigma. stigma. Yeah. So luckily my mom shielded us from a lot of that stuff. So 
I didn't necessarily, I experienced it secondhand later in life. Um, but growing up, didn't really necessarily have bad, bad experiences. Um, I had great leaders, great uh, young men's leaders who were, who eventually became mentors of mine and helped me later in life. So, but, look, but for the most part, it's been good. Um, you know, and they're l- luckily for me in my ward in, in Vegas where I'm from, we had like two other black families. So it was kind of like, we got, since my mom's white, we'd be like, oh, that you're, you're Charlotte's son. I was like, no, my mom's over here. I look nothing like that lady. <laughs> um, but, you know, overall, I, I just thought those were, those were funny and could make people feel some type of way sometimes. Yeah. Um, but overall, good experiences. I got you. Okay, so, so we got a full spectrum here. We have a very wide spectrum, which is yeah. why I'm really excited to kind of jump into this because we have different perspectives on it based off of our experiences. So we got a chance to lay out briefly our experiences when it comes to diversity growing up. And a lot of it focused on just maybe challenges we either faced or didn't face growing up in the church. So now being who we are and coming from the diverse backgrounds we come from now living in Utah, where our backgrounds are extremely diverse in contrast to the norm of people out here in Utah, how has our past experiences in life growing up as who we are in this country and in this church, how do you think that has maybe informed our understanding of racial issues within the church? And as a brief example, I'll say, you know, I grew up in Dallas, Texas, where it's a, it's a very conservative state. Um, with a lot of people that think the ways of old should still kind of prevail now, just in society in general, not even on just race. So in Texas, you know, you have people who still open carry with, you know, the 357 on their head walking around like it's the wild, wild west. <laughs> so you'll have, people like, <laughs> you'll have people like that just kind of walking around, just letting everybody know I have my rights and I'm going to hold, you know what I mean? So Cue the, wa- the that's where I come from. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So that's like where I come from. Um, and, you know, I have my own racial situations that happen to me with society as well as in the church. Kind of so I kind of have those, those uh, alerts that kind of hit in your head of, hey, I need to watch out when I'm over in this area. Oh, I see different comments or hear different comments that were said over here. Maybe I need to kind of be, uh, be a little bit more vigilant when I'm in this space. Um, all those things just kind of shape how I move around because I've had to and I've learned that. So. From that perspective, I want to know from you guys, how has your own personal life experience um, informed your understanding of the race issues within the church? That makes sense. Mm-hmm. So just kind of to the table, really, like if you have anything for that, by, by all means, you know. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to try to word this as best as I possibly can. So for me, even preparing for this topic, um, one thing I had to consider that I never considered before was just how our country was founded, like what our country was founded on and some of the um, the customs and things that were considered normal at that time and how we're trying to come out of that. Because the things that were normal at that time, from what I've learned, is it didn't make it right, you know, such as slavery mm-hmm. um, and our country being built upon um, the backs of slaves and it being something that is was like an economical status um, and so those things shaped people's feelings at that time right and i even revert back to like now like we have nostalgia right yeah like so that's kind of what it reminds me of it's like i'm like uh, OG millennial, right? I'm like on the very cusp of being a millennial. Why is that? Why is millennial? So, yeah, okay. what's, the, what's the next generation? Is it like Gen Z? Z, Y, 2K? Right? I don't know. So, I can go back and I can say, like, Gen Z, they'll never know what it's like to have the big green generator box be the hangout spot. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, the corner right there. Yes. Like, they'll Absolutely. never know. Like, it's just out of their realm. That's not normal, right. like, to them, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And it's like, it's nostalgia. Like, there's just some things one generation can't understand because that wasn't how they were raised. And so, Context. our country 
was raised on slavery that developed these racist and prejudiced and even superior feelings towards whites and blacks. And we are still struggling to come out of that, Mm -hmm. you know, and then considering the church being, you know, restored in 1830, where it's organized, was in, was being organized in the prime of a country that is dealing in, this is just kind of normal, like a normal way of life, you know, so for me, learning um, and getting that context and just thinking it's like, it's, I can see the struggle and I can see why we're struggling, you know, eradicating these racist feelings because, you know, our, it's, it was kind of like a normal and then from one generation to another, those feelings just kind of kept going. And now we're trying to bring equality and feelings of inclusion still, you know, because of how our country was built. I agree with that. Like, to me, it was logical it was logical to find out about racial issues in the church. So like church was reorganized in 1830 by Joseph Smith, who was white. The people who were there when he did it were white, mostly his family and and, and close friends. And then from there, those people went to talk to more of the people who were in their circle, white people. That's who they lived around. That's who they were around. That's their family and friends. So, and the church is predominantly white in the United States. If you were to tell me in a perfect world now that we made it from 1830 to now and not a single issue of of racism or racial inequality had happened in the church, I would think, liar. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) There's no way. There's no way. And it's not like we're the first ever to deal with this stuff. Exactly. This is universal. Absolutely. This this crosses every single church, church, uh, Entrance. Well, I think it happens everywhere. Outside of church, anything that's over, mm-hmm. any organization that's over a hundred years old yep. is going to have some type of history around racism. Racism yeah, or prejudice. Prejudice, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Even if it's just the fact that it was a group made for a separate, segregated population of the, of the community. Yeah. Like just knowing that, oh, this was founded for the black people here. Well, it was founded for the black people because they couldn't necessarily join mm-hmm. with others. Mm-hmm. Well, it was founded for the Latino community because they couldn't necessarily join with others. Right. Um, so all that is part of the context, especially with the United States and the world over, really, when you talk about uh, colonizing uh, countries and nations. But to me, it would have been weird to not have this kind of history. Mm-hmm. So for me, at that point, it's like, okay, now my issue is... My, my background and everything that tells me is like, okay, well, why haven't we addressed it? That was my question kind of going growing up. Yeah. It's here. It's obvious that it happened, mm-hmm. but it doesn't seem to be prevalent that there was a period of us talking about it, addressing it, and yeah. then getting over it. It's kind of that thing that kind of swept under the rug. It's exactly. just kind of yeah. avoided it because it was uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I love your perspective as well. Sorry. Will, what do you think? No, I, I agree. I think... Uh, The first time I actually knew about, you know, uh, black people being banned from the priesthood was actually on my mission. And I was 22. Mm -hmm. You know, the first time that I knew about, you know, some of our past presidents owning uh, enslaved people was when I was 25. You know, Mm -hmm. and so it's I think the more we know about what has happened in the past the more we can be greater as a society, as a people. And instead of hiding that and not informing people, we need to have these open discussions so that we can all come together and we can learn from the past because there's definitely things that we can, we can do to make our current situations better. Um, But yeah, that's, that's just kind of my thought. Just, you know, when, when I first initially came across it, I was, I was shook, you know, I was like, well, how, how are we, the true church, but we're still struggling with this. Mm-hmm. But then when you have the context of, you know, what, where America was at that point in time, yeah. it opens a whole nother discussion. And so I think keeping that context, but also, you know, knowing that, you know, men are fallible, um, but having that, that perspective can really change a lot of things for sure. So, uh, yeah, yeah, there's, there's two points that you, that you said about, you know, context and of the society at that time. I mean, we, we can't, I think it's really important for us to not to pile too many people in that, in that time period or say everyone was that way because 
there was abolitionists. There were people who were like True. who were like, "Hey, I think equality should be for for right. all all men." Yeah. I mean, we have members in our church who were that way. Orson Pratt, there's Sidney Rigdon, Joseph Smith, obviously. Right. They wanted everyone to have the equal opportunity to come closer to Christ and be able to receive the gospel, the priest, and all, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> but also, there's the opposite. There's a, there is people who are like that as well. Who yeah. you're like, no, nah, they don't deserve none of that. They are less than the dirt, you know. And then. The, the point about you were saying about how it's important for us to approach and pretty much accept the ugliness, the, the shadow, the thing we're sweeping under the rug. President Nelson is over 100, or not over 100, about to be 100 years old. You try to imagine the things he saw or the things he's heard, or maybe he was really sheltered because he was in Utah at that time and in a very small town where he didn't really get to see any of us mm-hmm. or really only heard what was on the tube, you know? And so the thing, and he comes out and saying, root out racism. You can only root out something if you dig into it or lack of a better analogy, you know, just look at it and being able to inspect and then say, this is what it is. This is the root of it and then get it out, you know? And so I think it's really good that the church and that we're trying to go into or into this and look at what's there and go beneath the surface and try to make these things better, you know, and try to make that, um, come to grips with just what, what happened in the past and, and continue to make those steps forward of staying wired. And understanding why we're here, and why we're staying. Yeah, I feel like that's the complexity of this topic because in order to really get an understanding, you, you have to be able to look at it through the lens of different time periods, different people and perspectives. Because, like you mentioned, like everybody didn't have those same feelings and perspectives, even though they were in that time period, yeah. even though that may have been like the dominating norm or custom at that time. Mm-hmm. And we see that just through reading scripture, it's like this was these are books written by people of a completely different nationality and a completely different region. They had different customs. So the wording may be hard for us to understand. Like if we really dig into their history, their past, do some, you know, some some research, we can then begin to see their their lens, right? And their exactly. point. And I feel like to at least find comfort on this subject, we have to be willing to go back, you know, do our homework to get some perspective then, and then bring it back to our air, you know, and try to fix it. We, we can't look at scriptures through like face value, just yeah. right here and yeah. look at what's on the page. You have to know the meaning behind the things, the context, the historical context. There's a lot of that that I think people just don't take the time to do, you know? And I think that's where we understand more when we actually do research and search the scriptures, we can learn a lot more. Yeah, and one of the things that you brought up for me was really big for me on my mission when I, similar to you, found out, like, I kind of knew there was something because my dad told me, like, when I was in high school, the only reason he wouldn't join the church is because the church was racist towards black people. Mm. And I was like, when? <laughs> like, like, I just didn't, I hadn't experienced that, yeah, really. Yeah. You know, like, there, I mean, people, I, I guess I viewed it more as a church doing something to us rather than people, which right. people have done that. But mm-hmm. for me, like I really, really found out about it when I was on my mission and hearing talks from like uh, McConkey and things that he would say back in the day that were crazy, you know, mm-hmm. um, yeah. if we think about the light that we have now. And my, I guess my first question back then was, has this happened before? Yep. And one of the things that gave me a little bit of comfort looking at that historical context is if you look at the tribe of Israel, yeah. there's only one of the tribes that were had the erotic priest, yeah. right? Levitical. But yeah, the Levitical uh, tribe were the only people who to have the priesthood. All other people were restricted from getting getting and using the priesthood. Yeah. So like that kind of gave me a little bit of comfort, not much, right. <laughs> but you know, like uh, another thing that, you know, McConkey said that actually helped me out a lot after I found it was his words after the proclamation came out, yes. which were powerful. Uh, we'll probably link it in the, in the bio, but that him saying like all the things that we said before were done without greater, are yeah exactly yeah like all those things don't matter now it's the it's now we have more knowledge 
God's given us more light. This is this is the law. This is what we're going to follow. So that gave me a lot of comfort. Now that's that brings up my next question because this popped up to me as Will was speaking, and you Mo as well. So we already know that people are stupid. Uh, you know, people Respect. are stupid. Respect. <laughs> you just, just look, go in and look at some of the things we've done <laughs> over the history that we have of this globe. People can be really stupid. Now, an individual, an individual person has the ability to see some of these things in their thought and you can get some intelligence, obviously, from, from that. But you, if you just lump in some of these things that we've done as people over the history of this globe together, it's like, what were we thinking, right? So we make mistakes constantly. We make mistakes. We're not perfect people. The, the people who hold offices and positions in the church are also imperfect people as well. So we have people that are in these leadership positions, namely prophet and or president of the church uh, in particular, who do their best to try to follow God because that's what the office and the position says they should do. But at the same time, they're trying to do their absolute best that they know as well. So they're mixing in whatever knowledge they can receive from God along with their own thoughts and abilities on how things should go, right? And here we are in the church and we're talking about the history where for a large period of time up until 1978, officially, um, people of color, namely black people, were not able to hold the priesthood in this church. It didn't start that way, but somewhere along the line, that was that restriction was put in place and it wasn't lifted officially until 1978. So my question is this. When we go back and we listen to the words of prophets and apostles and people who have held these callings over the years, knowing their position, maybe, or hearing some of the comments that they had before that light and knowledge came. And we hear those those teachings from these people. Should that affect our view or our take on their direction? And what I mean by that is. If we go back and read some of the talks from Elder McConkey. And this is before, you know, he kind of changed his point of view on it before that revelation came. Do we take it as word of God or do we take it knowing the person that it came from flawed as that may have been? Because in reality, knowing that history, I speak for myself, it's limited my ability to just kind of follow the words that were given in the general conference sessions or things that were, that came out from certain prophets and apostles. Mm. I look at them and I'm just like, you know, like mm. maybe that to me, that should have come from somebody else yeah. in my own head, because I know some of your history that's, that's been out and in your viewpoints on certain things. So to hear that from this person or that person is like, I don't know if I'm fully with that yeah. when it should be, we should have faith and trust in these people doing their absolute best to give us light and knowledge from Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ. So my question is, should that affect how we receive that knowledge, knowing that it comes from imperfect people? Yeah. I think something that uh, helped me on my mission when I first encountered, um, you know, I shouldn't have been doing this, first of all. <laughs> but, <laughs> Not about to be good. It's a great way to start off. But, uh, you know, just as a missionary, you're young, you're looking for ways to grow. And we had all these books. We had all these church history books. <laughs> and our uh, mission president was like, don't read those books, you know, stick to the doctor. Okay, okay. read those books. <laughs> read those books. Right, right, you know. <laughs> So uh, I read this this book about Brigham Young, and there was just all these things. And I'm, I'm not gonna go into it, but uh, all these things that he had said as a as a president, and it was really hurtful when I read those things. I was like, "What's, what's going on? You know, how can this be true?" Yeah. And I was reminded in that very moment. I'll never forget. I was reminded it was in personal study. I was like hiding the book from my companion. But I was reminded in that moment by the spirit that I needed to kneel down and pray mm. and ask if, you know, the things that President uh, Brigham Young had been teaching were true. 
And I remember praying and receiving a witness after that, you know, that he was a true prophet, you know, but there was error, you know, in some of those things that he had taught, you know. And so I, I like broke down and I was crying. I was like, wow, like, I didn't know. Like, you know, I, in my mind, I was like, oh, a prophet is perfect, you know? And then I was reminded of Abraham and Moses and yeah, yeah. all these other prophets, Peter. you know, that Peter. had yeah, made Solid. these mistakes, you know? And But we're still called a God. And I think when we come across this stuff, which we will, we need to pray. We need to ask for that witness, yeah. you know? And I think as we do that, our eyes will be open and we'll be more receptive to, you know, those things and stuff. That's a really good point. Just one about we this gospel, this this church started with a prayer. This church was created, foundations of it was through a prayer and and revelation. And so why would we not do that same thing with everything? <laughs> we shouldn't have blind obedience to any of the leaders. Yeah. I mean, we should trust them, <clears throat> but we should never just go blindly and say, yep, that's right. But I think when we don't pray about it, I think we have a witness that comes to us that lets us know, like, yes, this is what he's saying is truth. It is speaking to my heart. It is speaking to my mind. But I think it's really important for us, especially any, any things. So I feel like the, the world's going to be changing a lot here in the next couple of years. And there's probably going to be announcements made from the church that are going to probably shake people. And you're going to have to be, you're going to be pushed to a corner if you haven't already, is that you're going to be, you're going to have to pray and have revelation to know. Is this the true church? Is this what yeah. is what he's saying? The word of God? Is this not, you know? And I mean, even Brigham Young himself, he said, he's like, I fear that the saints have blind obedience. He's like, I'm trying. Actually, I think I got a quote. Let me, let me quote him instead of me trying to say this up myself. Mm-hmm. What a pity it would be if we were led by one man to utter destruction. Are you afraid of this? I am more afraid that this people have so much confidence in the leaders that they will not inquire for themselves of God, whether they are led by him. I am fearful that they will settle down in a state of blind self-security, trusting their eternal destiny in the hands of their leaders with the reckless confidence that in itself would thwart the purposes of God in their salvation and weaken the influence they would give to their leaders. Did they know for themselves by the revelations of Christ that they are led in the right way? Let every man and woman know themselves whether whether their leaders are walking in the path that the Lord dictates or not. This has been my exhortation continually. So we bring him young journal of discourses, volume nine, page 150. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably what I was reading. <laughs> Put but, your glasses uh, up, there, buddy. <laughs> to, in conclusion, no, but I, I feel that, I feel like even bringing young, him saying that, he's like, you, even if I, I'm speaking from the pulpit, you guys need to pray. You yeah. guys need to find out for yourself. Don't just sit there and listen and be fed. You need to digest it. You need to think about it. You need to, take it all in, you know, because also it's just at, at face value. And they're just like, yeah, that, I don't like how that makes me feel, but pray about it. Go in and do some research, actually find out. Don't just go what's on top level and what people are saying, you know? Um, and that's what I've had to personally do is that when I heard about these things, I learned about it right before my mission. And um, because I wasn't going to go out there and try to share the gospel to something I did not believe. I was not about to waste two years of my life. It wasn't a waste, but it was a blessing. But the thing is, I took that time to do research and actually yeah. pray about it and get revelation. And once you get revelation or have a, a vision or have an, an experience, nothing can shake you from that. And that's that's been a domino effect in history. Anyone who's ever had a dream or a vision, nothing keeps them from it. You know. Now, see, now here's my point that I'm going to bring back to what you just said as well. You read that quote from uh, President Mount Brigham Young, who was the second official church of the church, uh, president, excuse me, of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He's the one that succeeded Joseph Smith after he was assassinated. And knowing the history that we have of Brigham Young, and we're kind of talking about the subject matter that we're talking about today because that started with his dispensation of being president and prophet of the church. So then you hear that quote, and at face value, you're like, amen. Like, that's exactly how we should live. But then you know more about the person and you're like, there was a question you didn't ask. <laughs> there were several questions that you must not have asked. <laughs> but then that's the way he said you shouldn't pray, you know, if I'm thinking about it. <laughs> so I understand that. So that's yeah. why you're like, so you're hearing and you're like, yes, that's good. 
But then you look at the vessel and you're like, why didn't you? So how do you then navigate those feelings as you look for further yeah. light and knowledge from the source itself? You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's kind of part of some of the questions that we have now, because people will ask, and this is my next question for all of us here is why knowing that history of the church, would we still be here? Mm-hmm. Knowing that the, the history of the church is cloudy, especially when it comes to racial diversity and racial issues, racism in general, would we even want to be a part of it? Mm-hmm. Finding out what you found out, how did that not tell you I'm in the wrong place? Yeah. How did that not change your point of view? Why, 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 why? I hear it all the time. Yeah. To me, and I said it in previous episodes and things as well, it boils down to I know I'm where I'm supposed to be because I went to the source to find out where I'm supposed to be. Right. Mm-hmm. I didn't ask the bishop. I didn't ask my mom. I didn't ask, you know, people in my ward who held leadership positions. I didn't read words of the prophet to see. I took everything that I was taught and the testimonies given to me by other people that I'd heard. And I went to God. Yeah. And I asked God, hey, is this, is the doctrine they're trying to teach me yours? Is this the place that I need to be in to be yours? And if I follow this, like it says, can I return to you? And my answer was an overwhelming yes. Right. So that, that, like you said, you receive revelation, you receive that vision, you receive that direction from the source. It doesn't shake you when you hear, maybe not a shaky message, but a good message that comes from an imperfect person <laughs> as well. How do you not become shaken? It's because of that source that you find your, your testimony from. But. But that's my point of view. So I want to know from you guys, as we kind of get deeper into it, how has learning more about this church history and the prominent people that have led to some of that cloudy history of the church not pushed you away from it? Why are you still here? I think we need to have, or it's very important to have clarity, excuse me, just like in general, it's like a sense of sustaining. So, you know, there is a fine line, like we're not sustained, we're sustaining prophets and apostles, their mantle. We're extent, we're sustaining the mantle of prophets and apostles um, and that anointing by God, that they are called of God. We're not necessarily sustaining the man himself. I mean, there's clear indication of this um, in the Bible with David and Saul. Like Saul was anointed king and prophet at that time. and David refused to raise his hand upon God's anointed, even though he was trying to murder him. Mm. You know, God, or sorry, David sustained Saul in that mantle of God's anointing. And I feel like, again, we've kind of all touched on it a little bit here is that when prophets are speaking, you know, we, it is our responsibility as individuals to go to God and get clarification and revelation from him that what they're teaching is true. because. For instance, if they're teaching um, one group of people are being held from certain blessings than another group of people. Well, this book here tells me all men, you know, that God treats and sees all men as equal. His his hand is extended out to all men. Mm -hmm. But yet I have a person who's in leadership that's saying, well, these group of people aren't going to have the precept for a while. Just that alone, now I can go back to scripture and to God's actual word, take it, pray, and get my own revelation and comfort and know I look, okay, I can still sustain this person in God's anointing, but the doctrine is telling me something completely different. And um, I'm going to pass it off here, but um, again, preparing for this subject, that was the thing that really stuck out to me when I learned about how the ban was actually lifted is because President Kimball at the time was the only president through all those years that re, that sought unanim, nim, unanim, help unanimous. Or unanimous or unanimity, if that's the word I'm looking for, with the 12 and himself, that they all needed to be in agreement um, and he sought uh, revelation. No prophet up to that time has sought unanimity and revelation on the subject, they were just kind of going off their own feelings and um, and teachings at the time and sustaining previous um, prophets and, and teachings. 
And so that was the one thing that really stood out to me is that they actually sought God's and inquired of God to receive that revelation. And prior to that, it hadn't been done as a whole and as as a sustaining form. I think this, this is an interesting question because for me personally, there's, there's a lot I had to get through to get to the why. Right. Mm -hmm. And like how Crispin, how you said, like, it really comes down to knowing for yourself, right. is this the right place to be? Um, when I asked that question and I prayed, prayed about it, I got a, an interesting answer when I was struggling through this. And one of those, like through my, through the answers that I got, one of the things that was really big is like, there have been other prophets who have literally killed people. <laughs> Look at like, look at Paul, for example, mm -hmm. like he persecuted the saints. Like that sounds like, oh, he went after them and like hurt them. Said well, some stuff. Yeah, no, like, he no. was, <laughs> he was ex at that time, basically executing saints, mm -hmm. you know, and then he, he has a great, good experience and changes his name to Paul and becomes, you know, one of the, the New Testament prophets that we hear from the most mm -hmm. that we all follow that all of Christianity follows, but he had like a really bad past. And through that, I, I came to the answer that like the church is a living body mm -hmm. and living bodies are offered the atonement. Yeah. They, so we, if we want to accept the atonement, we have to also be forgiving. Right. So for, for me personally, like the church, like the church, Joseph, I mean, not Joseph Smith, uh, Brigham Young, some of the other leaders down the line, they didn't have that question of, oh, should we, should we give them the priesthood? And I think for me personally, like I'm grateful for, for President Kimball for asking that question and coming to consensus. Um, but Again, for me, I have to be willing to forgive people who made bad decisions. Mm -hmm. um, so that that was something that, that I was I was given, so that I could get past part of this issue as well. And that's why I'm I'm I feel I can stay here. Yeah, I, I feel like I'm kind of in that in that way as well. You know, from the beginning. That's all God had to do, had to work with. It was all these imperfect vessels, you know, these people who make mistakes, these people who are, can't understand the full concept of what he's trying to get across to them. Um, and I mean, even his closest followers, I mean, Peter, if you just think about Peter, bro, like yeah. he was walking with God himself, with Jesus Christ. And you just couldn't grasp the whole thing he was trying to explain to everybody. He was... Yeah. He cut off a dude's ear. He denied him three times. Yeah. I mean, Jesus Christ told him, hey, why do you lack so much faith? Like all these things. Why would you why would you think he's a great prophet? You know, if that's all you knew about the man. But you you learn to see that he, he did miracles. He did amazing things. He pushed the church forward. He just brought so much revelation and gave us so much scripture, or so much inspiration and I think if we if we only focus on the negative of of prophets, that's all we're going to see. But for me, it was kind of looking through that logical lens as well yeah. um, of saying, OK, these prophets, they're imperfect. They make a lot of mistakes and they're going to keep making mistakes in some in some uh, capacity. Um, but it was also just the, the thing I said before is revelation. You're getting on your knees and asking Heavenly Father. That's how you get your answer. That's how you can stay in anything. That's how you keep your anchor is asking Heavenly Father and reading his word. And the Lord will reveal it to you. He doesn't. He's no respecter of persons. He's going to tell you if it's right or not. And I think that's what's key for all of us when we go through any type of faith shaking it's sometimes good for us because it helps expose the patches or the the cracks and the things that we need so we can patch it up, you know? Absolutely. And so when I've had my, my faith has been shaken multiple times, but that's also what's made me more dedicated to following them. It's made me say, okay, this is something I may not know about. Maybe, maybe I should do some research on that and then find out and get more truth and more and more knowledge, which patches up all those cracks that were in my foundation from the first. So I feel like, um, if you seek revelation, you ask your father in heaven, 
He will reveal it unto you, the truth of all things. That's just as simple as it is. And that's what keeps me here. I've had too many miracles, too many experiences. Can I back up what we've been saying with this scripture? Yeah. So, like, this is in Doctrine and Covenants. And I've actually referenced this one before. Um, section one. So it says, Behold, I am God and have spoken it. These commandments are of me and were given unto my servants in their weakness. Right here we have God himself saying, I'm giving commandments to my servants in their weakness. After the manner of their language, that they might come to understanding. They don't have all understanding. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. And inasmuch as they erred, it might be known. They're going to err. They're imperfect. Right? And inasmuch as they saw wisdom, they might be instructed. They need to seek wisdom. They need to be instructed. And inasmuch as they sin, mm -hmm. that they might be ch <laughs> chastened, that they may repent. Yeah. His servants are going to sin. They may sin. As long as they repent, they're going to be chastened. As long, um, and, and as long as they repent. And as much as they were humble, that they might be made strong and blessed from on high and receive knowledge from time to time. Yeah. I mean, we just gave examples of all these great men who are called of God. And we take them as prophets. We read about their, their stories, their teachings in the Bible. So why are we so quick to forgive and listen to the words in these books. But like we have modern day prophets and apostles today, but we don't give them that same grace. And the Lord here is, is saying like, they're men, they're imperfect, they're weak. They may sin, but if they repent, you know, like, so I'm just like, why is it so hard? You know, I guess for us to accept the words of the past and accept those mantles and see their history, they, they weren't perfect. But it's like so hard for us to give the grace needed for, for our leaders today. Yeah. I, I think to that point, I just had this thought. Um, we, but we have to think like everybody that started with Joseph Smith and on, they were converts. They were converts to the church. And that, that just blows my mind. Like Joseph Smith was a convert. Brigham Young was a convert. Everybody was converts or and, and even though they were born into the church, they all had to develop their own testimony, you know, their conversion. They had to go through that experience. And I think looking at it like that versus like, oh, man, he was called to be a prophet. You know, he's perfect. You know, like he's untouchable type of thing uh, gives a different perspective, you know. Um, and I think, you know, as a missionary or even going through my own conversion process, like the things that I struggle with um, early on, you know, as I was trying to develop my testimony of Jesus Christ and uh, understanding the gospel principles to where I am now, like it's, it's a night and day difference, you know? And so I think, you know, realizing like, Hey, like they're called of God, but also like, they're still learning themselves. Like they're not whole uh, and they don't have that full understanding. Uh, helps you to be more like, okay, like, and they're going to say stuff or they're going to make mistakes because they're not perfect. You know, they don't have that full understanding. Just like our kids, you know, like our kids will do things um, that may upset us, but we shouldn't have that perspective towards them because we've had time to learn and understand that certain things are good and certain things are bad. And so like, we need to, understand that hey they're a kid and they're still learning and they're going to you know need more time to de to develop um so yeah, yeah that's kind of man so much stuff so the lord looks upon the heart man um i feel like you said a key word which is like perception like our perception of what a prophet should be look like or sound like has always been i feel like an obstacle you know like the lord um early on taught that lesson with the calling of David, right? He was small in stature. I forgot at the time who it was, the prophet, was it Nathan? Or I can't remember who the prophet was that the Lord had went out to, to get David. And it was between David and one other person. And he was like, oh, it's this guy because he was larger. But the teaching was the Lord look at the, look at the pun of heart. And we even saw that early in Joseph Smith time because Joseph was like, 
very he was charismatic he would wrestle with people and mm-hmm. things like that and people thought Hiram fit the fitting of more of a prophet than Joseph did because mm-hmm. he was more of like a stand up more serious yeah. type individual you know so it, it really goes back I feel like on just like what we feel our perception of prophet should be based on the Lord who sees the heart well, sure. and I, I appreciate those perspectives um, so much because I think that's why the questions kind of came the way they did because I wanted to get your perspectives as far as like your your history in the church, your own perspectives like that. But uh, um, I, what I find interesting is how our upbringing influences how we view this now. Our upbringing, our own life experience influences the prism we see these things through. And we, knowing our own imperfections and we being the group of people that historically were um, restricted in this particular sense, we look at it the way we do because society has taught us to see things a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. We grow up in the society where, you know, people would ask me, you know, how how can you be part of a church that, that supposedly doesn't like black people? Well, in my head, I'm like, America don't like black people. Why you, here? you know what I mean? Like, not not to be weird, but like that was my initial response. Like, America don't like black people. You live next door to me. Like, why are you here? <laughs> well, because it, exactly. So it's like there's, <laughs> it's not that cut and dry. You know what I mean? Is was my point that I would like say to them. It's not. It's not just cut and dry to say the church doesn't like black people because that in and of itself is also incorrect. Although finding out the history about the church, people get that point of view. Like, how can you be a part of this church? And they didn't even want you to be a part of it. I'm like, I got the priesthood. Yeah. I married my wife in Mount Spinoza Simple right up here down the road. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. And then they bring up the history and things like that. And I'm like, well, you know, look at this country. Look at many countries in the world that were colonized by uh, European countries. And, and the issues that are there, those are societal. Those are societal issues. And it's hard not to mix that together Mm -hmm. and which is why I loved your context comment that you said earlier about just looking at it through its actual context of the time this is 1830 the emancipation proclamation wouldn't even come for another 35 years Mm -hmm. and we think it's weird that somewhere along the line somebody was like I mean we shouldn't have to me it was logical that this would happen and it was still a struggle even after the emancipation proclamation things still weren't you know I do. So. Absolutely. So then, you know, you, that's why I was like, so how, does that, should that affect how we look at the people in leadership? And the reason I ask that is because we should have a way of just seeing past the person for the imperfections that they are and taking our though. concerns with God. And it is hard. Yeah, it's yeah. so hard. But at the same time, it's questions that brought about the church, which brings me, I'm seeing, look at God. Led to your comment, which was the reason why that question I feel like was put in my mind to ask because we got the context, and then your comment this church started on a question. We don't have the Church of Jesus Christ about it to say so. Joseph wasn't walking around in all these places, like, is this the way it should be? Like, where should I go? I have all these churches saying, I need to be here, I need to be there, I need to be there, and I don't know which one to pick. So rather than trusting these priests and pastors and things who are in this position of leadership to lead, rather than trusting him, let me go to Ask he God. who I can trust above all mm-hmm. and find out where I need to go. And he did. And he received his revelation in a way unlike many people in this earth may get. And we have this church now. That doesn't mean everybody who joins it is on that same level of guidance, is on that same level of, of, of revelation, is on that same mindset is in that same on that's in that same bandwidth or anything like that so of course people are going to be influenced by the spirit but people are still people and like i said before people can be real stupid at times they can be real <laughs> judgmental they can be ignorant they can be very respectfully <laughs> but that's why i just love what this church as a whole also preaches we all serve bishops and Correct me if I'm wrong, but we all got this little part of our uh, part of our repertoire when it comes to teaching the gospel. Now, I'm pretty sure we still use it. When we bring up the Book of Mormon and people who don't know anything about it, when we bring up the church 
or who don't know anything about it, we give our spiel, we give our testimony, we read some scriptures that we want to share with them about what we feel is truth, and then we end that by having them read in Moroni, where the scripture says, read these things, ponder them in your heart, ask God in sincere prayer. And after you ask, await his answer. And whatever that answer is, go with it. That's what missionaries do. As people who have served missionaries, you, you understand those yeah. well, We went to people and said, don't just trust us. Ask God. Yeah. And when he answers, follow it. That's why I'm here. I feel like that's why we're all here. And that's why we're working our way through this issue. But like you said, it's not, it shouldn't be difficult. It's not hard to say that. We're human, and it is, <laughs> but, but it shouldn't be because none of us are perfect. Yeah. Jesus Christ is not here. He's not physically on the earth as the president of the church. It's President Russell Nelson, who is a great man for all the things that he's accomplished here on earth and all the words that he said and the feelings that I've got from him. I feel like he is a real prophet striving his absolute best to lead God's people in the best way that he can. Mm -hmm. I feel that with almost every fiber of my being when I hear him speak. But there's that societal upbringing that we all have wired being black people in America or black people in this world in general that still says that's a white dude. And he's almost a hundred years old. I wonder if this was always his mentality, you know what I mean? Because what was normal for him as a kid is what we're talking about now, but that should not matter. Yeah. Because we're not man. following him per se. We're trying to follow him who he's trying to guide us to. So, um, well, I think too, we're all on this, we're all on a path to become more Christ-like. Right. And so like in the, in back in the day, people probably weren't as Christ-like because they had hate in their hearts for people who didn't, didn't look like them. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so like for Russell and Nelson, I'm sure, I'm sure he didn't hate people of different color. I mean, I can't tell you that for sure. I don't think so anymore. <laughs> but he's on, he's definitely on a, a path to become more Christ -like, more Christ like, and I think that's where we all need to we all need to get there. You know, we all need to be on this path. And like like I said before, like the the church is the church is a body of people, yeah. and so the church is still on this path to become mm -hmm. as a whole to become more Christ like. Mm -hmm. One thing about people when they say the church is true, the church is imperfect. It's full of, we are the body of the church. Like we, it's full of imperfect people. Yeah, so stop calling it true. The doctrine is true. Right. Yeah. You yeah. know, and so people are saying the church isn't true. Well, yeah, there's a lot of people who make mistakes in there. There's a lot of people who aren't in there. But the doctrine, the gospel, the gospel, this yeah. is never changing, never ending, never wrong. This is what it is, and it's nothing wrong with it. It's the truth. Yeah. And I feel like if we try to separate those things and understanding that when you walk in between, walk in those double doors, you can see people who are imperfect. There's going to be people who are on their path, trying to go through that covenant path. And it may be kind of narrow for them. They may be taking their step off and they're trying to get back on it, but they're in the process of walking Absolutely. towards that way. You know, they're going on the path. They're trying. And I think if we give people that grace just as much as we need it, how much more would it be easier to just stay in the gospel and to live it? If we give people grace that we're still needing. I love that because and this is my last point with it is we're all on the covenant path. We're all imperfect. We all have our own sins. We all have our own issues. This particular one we're talking about is seemingly obvious. Yeah. And that's why it's such a big deal because it seems logical to say it says all men, all men should, you know what I mean? So, so the issue of racism seems very obvious that we shouldn't think that way. So that's why I think people have such an issue with it. So let's take it back to the same old adage that we've probably all been told by our parents or leaders or anything like that. What if we were walking around and on our forehead, you could see our deepest, darkest secret? Mm. And we wore that on our forehead. How would you live like that? I mean, we're not happy. Like, like, <laughs> how would you walk around at that point? Like, if everybody really knew what your issues were, the way yeah. God does, would they look at you like that? Like if I'm up there bearing my testimony because I know God is real and, and I'm feeling and I'm in this moment, but at the same time, the issue that I might be going on 
just because I'm not talking about it right now or the issues that maybe I just came through are sitting right here too, does it get received the same way? Mm-hmm. Probably not because yeah. everybody gets to see your imperfections. But that's not stopping you from getting to him. The atonement is there for all living bodies. Yeah. We're on our path towards Jesus Christ, which means there's a there's moments of sanctification. <laughs> yes. There's moments of chastisement. There's moments of all these things where Heavenly Father has to look at you and be like, bro, get your stuff together. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, yeah. you need to get yourself right so we can get back onto that path like we should. For the church, this seems to have been a large stumbling block when it comes to its growth. But as we now see it, as we'll get into more in more of our series of this coming forth, it hasn't stopped anything. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one thing that I rejoice in. This issue that people can sometimes get hung up on hasn't stopped this growth at all in all communities. Look at us. Yeah. We're sitting here married, families, kids. Um, to, we have the priesthood ourselves. We're sealed in the temple. Our kids, because of our choices, will be affected in that positive way. And, we, and the hope and prayer is that that will be a generational thing that we propel forward. Uh, you know, so the growth is still there. God is still moving and he's still talking and we're living witnesses of that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We're seeing that, you know, that change happen now, you know, where, you know, we're able to walk into a church building and hopefully not, (laughs) uh, but we're we're able to walk into a church building and we're able to hold positions, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're able to see men that look just like us that uh, are able to serve in, you know, uh, leadership positions and things like that uh, to that nature. Uh, and you know, we have prophets and apostles that are constantly uh, talking about ways that we can improve, you know, and become more diverse and, and more uh, a, a worldwide church. And uh, I think, like you said, Christmas, it, it is it's, it's rejoicing to see that uh, around us, uh, especially at our age, you know, where we grew up in an era where, you know, in certain wards and certain places where we didn't see a lot of us. And so being at this table with you, brother, and uh, it's amazing. I, I never saw this uh, <laughs> in the future. But, uh, <laughs> never know. <laughs> we moved to Utah. This was not what I thought was going to happen. <laughs> you know, I, I just one last thought. I, I think it's really important is that we talk about how we don't our our brothers or sisters back, brothers back then didn't have the priesthood. But look at us right now. Mm-hmm. We all have the priesthood. We're living with the priesthood. Mm-hmm. And we get so hung up on that, but are we even living up to it? Are we even yeah. there? Mm-hmm. Ex- exercising our priesthood? Are we blessing our families? Are we blessing our children? Are we serving our fellow man? No matter what race you are, you're probably not. You know? <laughs> you're, you're probably not fulfilling it to its full measure as it needs to be. I mean, yeah. President Nelson, I think like, Three or four years ago, he gave uh, a talk that. about saying, men, we need to do better. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And that was a that kick. To the core. Right. Yeah. You know, and so if, if it's uh, if it's universal across everything and we have this opportunity now, let's not just only focus about what the past, but let's let's start to step into the present now and say, what can we do better? Mm-hmm. With what we do have, the gift that we do have now. Let's make it better. Let's get into the temple. Let's bless our families. Let's bless our children. Let's bring more brothers into the into the gospel. Let's help more brothers get the priesthood so that they can bless their families and so on. You know, I think it's really important for us to always take that step and step back and realize like, hey, what can I do now since I do have it? How can I bless someone and step in and be an extension of God's hand? We've been discussing during this whole um, show in terms of um, now being able to see the priesthood ban and just issues with race and the priesthood in general um, through the lenses of the time. So that way we can at least get some comfort in knowing that, you know, things weren't the same then as they were now. Um, This is a scripture, and I know I didn't give context on the last scripture I shared from Doctrine and Covenants for our audience who aren't aware of um, our standard works, but Doctrine and Covenants is just revelation that we have, um, that we use in the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, um, that was given through Joseph Smith and other leaders for our day, for modern revelation. Um, This one is actually from the Book of Mormon that we've heard quite often um, that I want to share. 
For none of these iniquities come of the Lord, for he doeth that which is good among the children of men, and he doeth nothing save to be plain unto the children of men. And he invited them all to come unto him and partake of his goodness, and he denied none that come unto him, black and white, bond and free, male and female. And he remembered the heathen, and all are alike unto God, both Jew and Gentile. So I've actually thought about this one a little bit more. This was wrote by Nephi, who was of Israel, Israelite descent, right? More than likely, he didn't know nothing about black and white in terms of race <laughs> like, at that time yeah. when he wrote this. But I know we use it because, again, we liken all scripture unto ourselves. So this is something in our time we can relate to. Yeah. But could Nephi really have related in terms of race, black and white, in his time when he actually wrote this? No. No, probably something to think about, right? So, um, if we want to look at it through the lens of that time, and we can look at it to relate to our time today and see, like, all right, we know God um, accepts all men. Now, looking at it through the lens of the Lord, I want to share this other scripture. That way, we can see there's like a pattern, right? Yeah. Um, of how the Lord gets his message across. So that way we can see like the actual doctrine behind this. This one's in Alma 11 and it says, now this restoration shall come to all, both old and young, both bond and free, both male and female, both the wicked and the righteous. Mm -hmm. Right? So if just same pattern, same wording, the only change was instead of black and white, it's wicked and the righteous. Right. So now we got a spiritual context. Like we can see, even though we can relate to black and white as race in our time, we know the doctrine isn't about skin color. It's about our spiritual standing Absolutely. and our spiritual status. Yeah. It's that Hebrew right. idioms that help Absolutely. paint that picture and help give you background to what black and white means. I mean, if you go in the Old Testament, there's many scriptures that talk about I, my skin was black or I became black. It actually means like gloomy. It means like sad. It means um, dark and is, yeah. is in meaning like right. depressing, you know? And I think that too many of us, we take things too literally. And that's what I was talking about before about so scripture. Yeah. You can't take yeah. things yeah. to the surface. Yeah. 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 Scriptural, context. spiritual things can only under, be yeah. understood spiritually. Right? And that's why yeah. I wanted to bring this up. Yeah. Yeah. Context is, and, and time frame is it's everything exactly. in, in our interpretation. Yeah. Well, this has been yet another episode of Brothers in the Foyer. This is episode one of our Brothers on the Priesthood series. There will be more to come. We'll be bringing guests in to give us more of a historical context, as well as some of the other historical facts and, and um, issues that have come up through it, as well as we explore this topic a little bit more. But we thank you so much for tuning in. Um, please like, subscribe, share, follow, and um, the resources that we have along with the things that we have shared will be posted in the link below as well. But we thank you so much. Tune in next time. See you guys. See you.